Jim and Chad go in one of the back rooms. Chad ponders how to phrase his concerns about what Gary told him. What's the matter Chad? Jim asked. Give me a second to think about this. Jim, I've known you for years and I like to think you're someone I can trust. Is there something going on here that these guys aren't telling me? Jim hesitates for just enough to concern Chad then says no man. Trust me. If shady shit was going down I would tell you. The real enemy is out there and we're here to protect you from whatever sick game he's playing. Chad nods and leaves the room. He confirmed his suspicions but was not sure what to do next. He thought about trying to call Gary back but the burner phone was probably smashed. Suddenly he heard on the speaker that Flo 8 was missing now too. Outside in a covered area near the concert. Rob sat in a chair tied up and gagged. The door to the room opens and Flo 8 is thrown in tied up. The men holding them are wearing Guy Fawkes masks. None of them say a word until another guy, tall and intimidating looking enters the room. Okay gentlemen you're going to answer some questions for us or you're going to join your friends in the upcoming fire storm. The music stops on stage as Saul and the remainder of his team cut their set short. Backstage, everyone is gathered around. So now we're missing Flo Itz too? How is he snagging our guys right from under us? Asked David B. Loth. His guys are blending into the crowd. They must have them captured somewhere close. I hate to say it but I think our best bet is pulling out our trump card. We have to do our final act. Says Saul. Derek draws near the tent. He sees the stage is empty. The timer is down to 30 minutes. He calls Mickey. They're either stalling or changing their strategy. Let's force their hand. We only have a half hour. Wake up that crowd. Suddenly several crowd members start yelling for the show to keep going which instigates the rest of the group. The place starts going crazy. The Mexican guards have to push the crowd back. Major anxiety is building in Chad. He knew this moment was coming but he was still not prepared for it. There were bad people around him but he still wasn't sure if they were outside or backstage. He needed to find a way out of this before it was too late. He always wanted to play to a crowd of this size but these were not the conditions he had envisioned. Just then he felt a buzz in his pocket. He had a text from an unknown number telling him when you hear the shots run towards the lake. Chad was utterly confused. All right ladies and gentlemen time for your final act. Says Jim on the microphone. Chad did his best to bottle up the many questions bubbling up until later. He reached into a hidden pocket in his coat, pulling out his last remaining quaaludes. Just a few. The last time he muttered, swallowing them. He grabbed his guitar, as him and Willie, and the two Billies marched on stage to join Jim and a thundering ovation from the audience. Mole sat at his piano. Armstrong and Bridal had a guitar as well. From where they were standing Chad thought he saw a reflective sheen like on glass in front of them, but it could have been his imagination. Meanwhile, Derek was watching his masked men beat the piss out of the captured musicians. There was a phone ready to call McCrusty or Swagger in case they couldn't get Chad and needed to offer an exchange. His phone rang, he answered right away. We've managed to detain two of their snipers in the scaffolding, replacing them with our own. There are two more sniping nests that we can't get to. If we proceed then they'll retaliate immediately, said a gravelly voice. Are you in an optimal position to fire at the stage? Derek said. Yes, the final act is about to begin and we can see all four targets. He responded. Good, take them out after the opening verse. Then our operatives hidden in the crowd will obtain Chad. After he is in our hands we'll find and capture the remaining members. Said Derek coldly. Roger said the voice. Derek hung up moments before he heard the opening guitar riffs begin to play. Chad began to sing the lyrics they came up with. The audience was cheering so loudly that he almost forgot that this wasn't a real concert. Everyone was playing intently but looking around tensely. 
Chad looked over to Willie Mole briefly, then back again when he realized that there was a glowing red dot on his forehead. This confused Chad for a moment. Before long, there was a loud bang as a crack appeared in front of Mole's face in what appeared to be a thick yet barely visible pane of glass. Chad could barely react when the same thing happened to the other three band members on the stage. The glass in front of Willie Mole, who was now behind his piano, was cracked again. This time it shattered. Chad ran behind an amplifier for cover. Chad considered running backstage when suddenly a man in black body tight outfit with a sniper rifle strapped onto his back slams into the stage from the scaffolding above. Chad watched in horror as blood pooled out of the body. Then he felt a hand grab his shoulder. He swung around to get free or punch someone but it turned out to be Jim. What the hell is going on? Screamed Chad. It's not safe here, get backstage now. He pointed to the door near the left side of the stage. Go. Jim brandished a pistol which he pointed toward the audience. They have gunmen in the audience firing now too. I don't know how they got the weapons past security. Jim yelled into his earpiece. Chad looked to see how the audience had turned into a real mob scene, then he scrambled for the door. Meanwhile the Mexican guards had abandoned their posts around the stage, joining the brawl. Take down the men with the guns! yelled Nick who had pulled off his disguise. The audience was really getting into a frenzy now. The act on stage was running around shooting into the scaffolding. Nick and the rest of the group were grabbing random audience members to find out if they had weapons. Some of the ones that did were firing from behind some of the crowd at the Mexican guards and Nick's group. The security guards outside the event were hearing gunshots, so they were about to head in through the gates to investigate. Meanwhile Chad had closed the door to the backstage area, but not before receiving a stray bullet through his left leg. He screamed in pain, but he realized that it had ripped through the surface of his leg, so he could still walk. Chad was grabbed and thrown inside the backstage area. Barricades were placed on all visible entrances as far as he could see. There was no escaping now he thought. He turned around and saw Saul and Nick and the remaining guys suiting up with riot gear and armor. What the fuck was that? Who was that guy that fell onto the stage? I need a medic I've been hit. Chad screamed. Derek's men have begun the war. We anticipated that the sight of you was going to ignite the flame. We need you to stay in the back room. They're going to come hard and heavy now against our enforcements and it's going to get ugly real fast," said Saul. Chad was led by two of one's guys into a back area where they bandaged up his leg. Outside in the chaos, the audience created a full-blown riot of people fighting each other. The Mexican soldiers brutally struck anyone getting near the stage. Derek observed from close by near the tented area. He talked to Mickey on the walkie-talkie device. They got him locked up in there with a ticking time bomb about to go off. We got a strike fast. Tell the troops it's time for the Blitzkrieg mixed with a little exodus. Mickey found it amusing they were using German and biblical strategy names. All right we're gonna bring out the heavy weapons. He tells his men. In the field, bodies start piling up as the riot continues. The police are trying to take control of the situation but there's too much crazy people for them to be able to get near the stage and they don't want lawsuits. One's men guard the backstage entrances. In the distance they see a large group of men in Guy Fawkes masks slowly approaching the stage. They stop and separate creating an opening for a giant APC tank that joins them. The crowd runs away as the tank and the forks march toward the stage. One's men get in fighting stances and brace for impact. Inside, Chad is panicking wondering what is going on outside. Saul and the others see through the monitor that Derek's men and the tank are coming at them. Shit things are about to get even uglier boys. Get into positions. Chad hears this and tries to open the door but realizes it's locked. Suddenly his phone buzzes and he receives a text saying there's a bomb inside there. You have to get out now. 
Chad shook in fear. He didn't know if he believed it. A second text came. It was a picture of the bomb being placed backstage somewhere. That made it a bit more believable. Chad banged on the door demanding to be let out. There's a fucking bomb in here. You have to let me out. He yelled. No reply came. He kicked the door but that plan failed miserably. He looked around the room. No crowbars of any sort. He decided to text back the number that he was trapped in a room and no one was listening to him. I can't help you right now. You have ten minutes. I believe in you Chad looked at his phone in disbelief. Ten minutes? He tied a handkerchief around his wound and limped around the room for something to help. He found a dull knife. He wedged that into one of the bolts in the hinges in the door and slowly began to unscrew the bolts. He heard the sound of a thundering cannon and began to unscrew faster. Outside, the tank was wildly spinning the main gun around in order to take down some of the enemy's numbers. However, Willie Mole had the idea to blast the smoke machine toward the tank, causing the driver to have difficulty aiming the cannon. They fired, hitting some of the audience members instead. Limbs and body parts flew everywhere. Some of the more drugged up audience members thought this was part of the show. By now the rest of the resistance except for a select few was in the crowd. Saul was surprised at how many fighters Derek had on his side. They were getting too close for shooting, so they began to just punch each other. The tank kept firing through the smoke, this time it hit two of Derek's own men along with Bozo's arm. Dom was crushed under the tank treads in the pandemonium. Nick and the rest of the resistance grabbed the hose coming out of a porter John. They pushed it into one of the ventilation slots on the tank. Meanwhile, the security outside were calling for backup from every police squad in the city. They realized this wasn't a typical concert riot and they had to take down all of the hostiles immediately. The tank began driving around recklessly due to the horrid smell, eventually crashing into the stage head-on causing the top area to collapse. Sirens began flaring loudly and all around. Derek nears the tent with the two hostages. He looks down at his phone and sees that there's only five minutes left before the bomb goes off. He decided to act fast and start Operation Exodus. Meanwhile back inside the stage area, Saul, Billy and the remainder of the resistance aim their weapons at the doors they anticipate will burst open with Derek's guys. Saul sees on the monitor that Juan's men are getting overpowered and decides to call an audible. He whispers in Billy's ear and then tells his team's men this is it. We will not back down to this enemy. We've worked too hard for this to go to waste. Them storming in here gives us probable cause to defend ourselves. Do not be afraid to shoot to kill. The situation really kicked into them now that this wasn't just a show anymore but their lives on the line. Just then the doors get blasted open. Saul and Billy take that moment and run back towards the changing areas. Gunfire is heard. Two figures stumble into the room. Bozo, Rob, Steve and Slash fire their weapons unleashing all their rounds. Their aim is poor but it eventually takes down the figures. What the hell? Where's the rest of them? There was only two? Says Rob. Just then they looked down and saw who they shot. Dave and Flo Eights. Holy shit dot 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 we killed them. They threw them in and we murdered them said Bozo, wrapping up his injured arm with cloth. Just as everyone stopped and reflected the remainder of the doors ripped open and a bunch of Derek's men stormed inside tackling the musicians and stripping them of their weapons. Mickey follows behind them. Check the back area and quick. Just three minutes left on the timer. The door was jammed shut. The men kicked it hard trying to make it budge. Mickey ran over with a crowbar and with his powerful grip ripped open the door. To his surprise the room was empty. They took him. There must be another exit around here. No time to look though. Let's get fuck out before this place blows. Said Mickey. They run out to police squads storming the area. They tried to apprehend Mickey and the guys but they outrun them. Freeze. 
shouts the cop as a huge ball of fire engulfs the stage behind them with a powerful blast knocking out everyone in the general area. Meanwhile, Chad was running towards the lake per the instructions in the text. He heard a massive explosion, then he felt a shockwave which knocked him off his feet. He got up again and kept running. He wasn't sure who he could trust anymore. But he had a feeling about this. Just then Saul and Nick tackled him to the ground. They had been running after him for some time. Where do you think you're going Chad? We were supposed to stay together. Said Saul between breaths. That was a freak in war zone. Yell Chad. You didn't say that Derek would be prepared with a friggin' army? I thought this was going to be a bait and switch, not a giant clash with this guy. Nick responded, Look Chad, we underestimated Derek. We weren't sure what to expect, but our plan was the only way we could stop him. Saul sighed, and looked at Nick. Maybe it's time we take him to the real leader of the resistance, now that we're the only ones left. Nick nodded. Chad glanced at the lake, but then he asked what do you mean real leader? Nick shot an angry glance at Saul. Never mind that Chad. We gotta get out of here fast. Derek's skies are still hot on our trail. Good thing we followed you or we would have been body parts raining from the sky. The commotion of the police sirens, people screaming and ringing in their ears made it difficult to hear each other. Just then they get spotted some of the men in Fork's masks who started running in their direction. Saul sees them first. Shit we gotta move now. The three of them run towards the eastern side of the park. The Forks were gaining ground. Seemingly out of nowhere a helicopter appears being flown by Willie. The three hop on and fly up in the air out of reach. The chopper gets about 100 feet in the air and then starts shaking as if it were hit by something. Willie straightens it out and flies south. Not far off Derek still with his eye in the sniper scope smiles. All right little pigs, time to show me where your brick house is Derek says weirdly. He radios Gary. They're leaving the park via chopper. You'll see where they're going on the computer. I tagged them. On the other line Gary knew exactly where they were going and that the conclusion to this sick experiment was their next move. Nick tells Willie where they're headed. They fly toward uptown. Chad, looking out the window, immediately recognizes his apartment. Before he can ask why they're here, Saul jabs Chad with a syringe full of anesthesia. They land in an empty parking lot nearby. On the way into Chad's apartment, Several people asked why he was unconscious, but Nick explains that he had been partying too hard. They were used to that from Chad so they weren't suspicious. Nick and Saul take Chad up to his room. They unlock the door using Chad's key ring. The room is still a mess of course. They toss Chad onto his bed. So how are we going to do it? Asked Saul. How are we going to conclude this documentary? Nick responded, it's got to be dramatic. Let's face it, his stardom isn't going to last. After a show where the stage blew up and the audience members get shot by a tank, it would cripple his career. He looks at the window. I think I know of a spectacular finale. Saul reading Nick's mind says no that would be way too messy. We have several witnesses seeing us and to the building. He falls while we're here. We're instant suspects. In order for this to work he has to die hours after we leave. Tragedy without strings attached. I'm thinking laced queer ludes. It fits the bill of a recovering junkie back in the limelight. Concert turns into terrorist attack. Bandmates that for all the public knows are his friends dying horrifically. Him seeing no other relief besides the familiar high of an old friend coursing through his veins. This one being his last. Conveniently his addiction being one that's been out of production for decades. Tons of crazy shit slipped in back then. Okay so how are we getting it in him? He can't swallow while unconscious. Asks Nick. We'll wait until he gets up and then make him really need one. Responds Saul. Meanwhile nearing closer. Derek calls Gary. They just got to his place. They want to end this now. How close are you? 
I'm not going to be able to take them all on myself. Says Gary. Right around the corner. Replies Derek. Chad slowly comes too. He sees familiar surroundings. He almost as it was all a dream moment. Then he sees Nick having a cigarette and Saul talking on the cell phone. Saul notices that Chad is awake, hangs up and sits on the bed. Listen Chad, you passed out after we picked you up in the chopper, probably from all the stress. We brought you up to your room since we were in the area. Also, we have some bad news. After the disaster at our concert, your agent called and said he's done with you. He left some voicemails on your room phone. He nodded to the phone. You're finished Chad. Chad felt a wave of anxiety hit him that he hadn't felt in months. There was only one thing on his mind to assuage his feelings. Just at that moment Saul placed some quaaludes on the counter next to Chad. We managed to have some of these from our stockpile of out-of-production drugs. We leave them here to use at your discretion. Nick and Saul put on their coats. It had started to rain. They tell Chad that they are making a stop at the drugstore to get more cigarettes, then they'll come back to talk about how Derek won't give up on him and Chad's future. As they leave, Chad eyes the bottle like a hungry shack watching a hot dog. Meanwhile Derek is running into the elevator with Mickey to Chad's room. They avoid eye contact with hoods up as well as avoiding security cameras. This occurs seconds after Nick and Saul enter the other elevator going down. Derek and Mickey have their weapons ready on their waists, not sure what to expect. They kick the door down and raise their weapons. They see Chad lying on the bed, a pill bottle in hand. Derek puts down his gun and checks Chad's breathing. Derek, I'll kill you. Mutters Chad in a semi-conscious state. I was afraid they would try to poison him said Derek as he takes some ipecac out of his pocket, and forces Chad to eat it. Looks like he only took a few said Mickey, examining the remaining contents of the bottle. Chad turns over, vomiting onto the carpet. That's it, get it all out said Derek. He hands Chad some water. Freeze. Yelled some policeman that suddenly appeared by the open door, pointing guns inside. Son of A. Yelled Mickey. Derek was puzzled how they were alerted to come here, but he had his suspicions as to who it was. Derek and Mickey raise their hands to show they aren't holding. Back against the wall. Yells the one cop as the other goes and grabs Chad. Officer on what grounds do you have to break in here? I hope you have a nice warrant otherwise you'll be hearing from a few lawyers I know. Derek tells them. We had probable cause from a neighbor stating that one of the tenants came up here looking drugged up with two shady looking characters. We have grounds to believe that he was in danger, says cop one. Which is why we came up here too. Chad was about to choke on his own vomit before we came and saved him tells Derek. Is that so? Sir please take a look at these two gentlemen. Were they saving you as stated? He says to Chad. Chad gathers himself and upon seeing Derek he panics. That's him. That's the guy who killed my sister. Chad begins to try and attack Derek but is restrained. Sir please calm down. We will get you out of here and to a safe location. The one cop takes him downstairs while the other along with a third cop who appears watches Derek and Mickey. Meanwhile Saul and Nick hear the sirens outside and see the cops entering the building. Shit how did they get here so fast? There's no way he's dead yet. Says Saul. They try to enter the building but are forced back by the cops. Two cop cars leave the building. One containing Chad. One with Mickey and Derek. Saul and Mickey meet back up with Willie who's still at the car and follow the cops. Willie drives Saul and Nick as they tailed the cop cars carrying Chad. How did they fucking get there so fast? They were supposed to arrive an hour later. Asks Nick angrily. Someone intervened here and sent them in early. We have to follow them and find a way to get him out of there so that we can finish his story. Says Saul. They follow the cars for a while. Longer than expected. 
These can't be Manhattan police. We're leaving the island, says Saul as they take the Queensborough Bridge into Queens. Something's not right here, says Nick. They continue driving until they get to what looks like an abandoned police station. They park the car a couple blocks length from the where the cops are. They see the cops bring Chad inside. Where the hell are we and why are they bringing him inside there? Asks Nick. Couldn't tell you but this is not how it's supposed to go down. Chad tells them who we are. There could be a manhunt out there looking for us. We have to get inside and get him out of there. We can't leave any witnesses either. Says Saul. Inside the station, Chad is in what looked to be an old interrogation room. Chad was very confused about the whole situation. He nearly died from what had to be a tainted quaalude and instead of being in a hospital he was in a cold abandoned police station. The door opens and two of the cops enter. Chad faces one and yells. What the hell am I doing here? I nearly died before. Why did you bring me here? Relax. We just need you to answer a few questions. Those men at your apartment, you said one killed your sister, what makes you so sure it was him? I will never forget his face. The day they came to tell me about her death, they showed me a picture of the man leaving her apartment. He brutalized her so bad we couldn't recognize her. Lexi was so innocent. I never meant for her to get mixed up in my life issues. Then a week or so ago I saw him again. I panicked and fled. I was a pussy. I felt like he was going to finish the job and get me too. Well Chad, you're in luck. We have the son of a bitch in the next room. I'm sure you would love nothing better than to silence him forever and give your family peace. Correct? Chad thought about it. He wasn't sure if that was a rhetorical question or he was being given an opportunity. The other cops spoke come with us the three of them left the room and went across the hall. Chad saw through the see-through mirror the man who changed his life forever. He was finally going to get some answers. Wait right here. When we're finished interrogating his accomplice Mickey, we'll be back to take you in to confront him. After they left, he waited patiently as Derek did as well inside the room. Then, Chad started fiddling with some buttons until he realized that Derek could hear him if he pressed a certain button. He could hear Derek as well. Chad, not wanting to wait any longer started to investigate Derek. I know you've killed many musicians, but what I want to know right now why you killed my sister. Derek looked unruffled. Listen kid, you're in over your head. Do you realize that those cops wouldn't normally let you in there? Derek said. Answer the question. Chad yelled. Okay, I guess now as good a time as any said Derek. Several years ago, your friend Gary. Your extremely wealthy friend Gary ran into a bit of a snag. He had gambled away too much money to some powerful people. He needed some money fast. Through his strange connections, he discovered a group of people interested in performing a very strange experiment. You were the perfect candidate, your success in the music industry at such a young age combined with your ability to be manipulated was ideal. Gary carefully sold your personality traits, information, past history to them. Your fame from that point forward was carefully controlled for the experiment. Your sister however was concerned about your health for a while with the drugs you've been taking. When she learned about the plan that you were a part of she was determined to let you know. That's when I came into the picture. Gary wanted you out of ruining the experiment so that he would get paid. He hired some schmuck to threaten your sister, to get her out. I got wind of the assignment, your background, and your sister. Derek looked lustful for a second. I am willing to take any assignment kid, but only for taking out people who deserve it. Your sister didn't deserve getting scared like that, nor should she stop helping you. So, I took the job. Breaking into your sister's apartment was the easy part but telling her that she was barking up the wrong tree was harder. So, we came up with a plan to fake her death to escape. Unfortunately for me, Gary had planned to frame me as well. Soon news got out that I was the culprit. 
your sister is alive Chad, I came here to save you as well. Soon after Chad finished processing that, the cops came in. Now it's time to get personal with the bastard, said the cop. The partner had interesting news for us. They walked with Chad into the actual room that Derek was in. Handing Chad, the gun, they ask if he's ready to kill Derek. I'm not killing Derek, said Chad. That's not a problem said the cop. We were going to shoot him, frame you for the murder. Then shoot you as well. Chad horrified, watched as the cop pulled the gun from Chad's hand. Before he could shoot anyone, Derek, who had freed himself, punched the cop, grabbed the gun, then shot the other cop in the head. Then he shot the first cop in the leg. Chad nearly pissed himself again. Derek proceeded to demand who hired them. The cop stuttered about someone that looked like that guy who yelled at the volleyball. Gary Chad as well as Derek said together. Meanwhile, Saul and Nick approached the building, looking for a side entrance or vent that they could sneak into. Nick looked at Saul how do you want to play this? We go in through the front we might be walking into a trap. Or it could be a legit operation and in that case what exactly do we say to them? I have an idea. Let's indeed go through the front. Says Saul. They walk through the front door. The station had a cold feel to it, empty except for one man sitting at the front desk. He didn't look like any of the cops they saw before. He eyes them. Can I help you too? he asked. Saul replied why yes we are here to see our client Chad. He was brought in here just a little while ago. The man checks the computer. Yes, he's currently in the back room with two of our officers. I'll take you to him. He leads them through the station. It has a dark and gloomy feel to it. They approach the interrogation room. They should be in here he opens the door and they see nothing but hints of blood splatter. What the foo? The man says before Saul knocks him out cold. Okay they can't be far. That blood looks awfully fresh he says. They leave the room, take the gun off the cop and search the rest of the station. Meanwhile outside in the escape van, Willie is waiting with the engine running listening to a romance novel on his iPhone. Suddenly he's blindsided by the back door being pulled open and Derek and Chad entering. Derek holds a gun to Willie's head. If you want to survive this day take us to this address he tells him. Willie presses the gas and the van starts moving. Chad and Derek sit in the back seat heads lowered with Derek holding his gun to Willie's back. Chad was still trying to comprehend the last 20 minutes where his world seemed to turn completely on its head. He had no idea who was who anymore. The man who ruined his life was apparently the one trying to save it. The man he thought was his best friend for all these years was actually the one trying to destroy him and his sister who he thought was dead was apparently alive all this time and was in love with Derek. Chad wasn't sure where they were headed. Something urged him to go with Derek. He wanted to go to Gary like he thought they were headed. They got to the location. Then Derek handcuffed Twilly to the car as they headed to a mystery house by the water. I figured he wouldn't go back to his house, said Chad. Oh, we're not at Gary's hideout. This is my hideout, your sister is inside, we need to make sure that she is safe. They walked up the stairs leading to the front door. Chad was surprised at how nice yet inconspicuous the place looked. No one would have suspected the place as a hideout. They checked the surrounding area. No sign that they were followed. Derek reaches for his keys and opens the door. They enter the dark house. Derek closes the door. Chad sees the various computer parts scattered throughout the house. Something felt odd like someone rummaged through the place. Where is she? Is this place always this messy? Asked Chad. No which is getting me worried. Follow me. Last I left her she was upstairs in the control room. They find the stairs and head up. The hall is quiet. Derek leads Chad down to the last door where the control room is. They walk in and see Lexi but she is not alone. Filling the room was five men wearing the forks masks. 
Lexi sitting down and a gun against her head held by none other than Gary. About time you guys showed up. Was worried this wasn't going to be an exciting ending. Gary says. Gary dot 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 I trusted you. All these years I thought you were by my side, supporting me, through all the shit that came at me. Now I find out you're responsible for it. Why? Why did you do this? What did I do to deserve this betrayal? Asked Chad. He looks over at his sister. A face he hadn't seen in so long. There were scars and a change in hairstyle but it was definitely her as hard as it was to believe. Gary began we had a real good thing going. You were the talent, I was the money manager. And the money was very good. Unfortunately, you couldn't keep off the drugs and the women so we had to keep an eye on you at all times. You started missing gigs and the money began to dry up. You were losing your fans. So, I came up with an idea of creating a new life for you. New bandmates, new record producers and teamed up with a pretty powerful TV production company to make you a star. The world would see you again in a whole new way. Television was the new medium. The thing is you couldn't know it was contrived or it wouldn't have been natural. You were going to be the ultimate reality show making tons of money without even knowing why. It would have worked perfectly if your sister here didn't butt in and try to warn you. She would have ruined everything so the production company hired Derek and his men to deal with her and anyone who got in the way. Little did we think that he'd actually fall in love with her and nearly fuck it all up. Your bandmates found out and went over to her place to talk to her. Things got out of hand and got physical. Derek here came by and killed them, then escaped with your sister. I killed them to protect her. Your greed made you heartless, willing to screw over your best friend and kill the closest person in his life to get you ahead. Now I've done things I'm not proud of but I'd never do that. I didn't feel good killing them but it was to protect an innocent person. He fed you lies about me Chad. We were trying to save you from him and those so-called musicians that were leading you to your eventual death. Tragedy is the biggest ratings boost. Says Derek. Wow, Derek you're not as dumb as you look I guess. Here's the deal. Since you're now fully aware of this, it kills the whole half Chad off himself a plan. So, your choice is this, hand over all publishing rights to me or I'll kill your sister right here and now. Chad wanted to beat up Gary to save his sister. He wanted to run up there and beat the piss out of his best friend turned monster that manipulated his life for profit. But with the guns pointed at him as well as her, he wouldn't risk losing her again. Fine I'll do it just let her go. Lexi had a startled look on her face that protested that he was giving up his life's work. But her life was on the line so she didn't say anything. You sure about this kid? Just because your life was the ultimate reality show doesn't mean your talent's not real, said Derek. Maybe we can strike another deal with Gary. Chad looked adamant. No, I'm done living the rock star life. Gary snapped his fingers. A fox mask guy walks in with a laptop. Gary types on the keyboard with one hand, keeping the gun on Lexi with the other. Chad enters in some passwords and pin numbers, then it's finished. Pleasure doing business with you gents, says Gary Riley. Now follow me outside and we can go our separate ways. They uneasily step outside with Gary still holding a gun to Lexi, as well as his men at the ready to fire. Okay Gary. You got what you wanted so hand her over now. Says Derek. Well I know how well prepared you are Derek, and you might have more men come after me, so I'm going to need some security on my way to my early retirement. Says Gary. What the hell does that mean? It's just us two. No one else. We just want Lexi back and nothing more. Replies Derek. Well I like to play on the safe side sometimes so you can get her back in the middle of the ocean. Said Gary. Just then, Gary heads over to a small yacht docked at the nearby pier. You son of a bitch. Give her to us now. Says Chad as he begins to run after him but is stopped when the men in forks masks raise their guns and aim at him. 
they all aboard the boat and begin sailing away from the pier. What the fuck are we going to do now? I just got her back and now she's gone again. We've got to follow them somehow? It can't end like this, yells Chad. Derek slaps Chad. Calm down, I've got an idea. Derek runs back to the hideout and grabs a case containing a sniper rifle and tracker projectiles. He constructs the sniper rifle, loads the projectiles and aims toward the boat. He fires, hitting the lower back of the boat where they wouldn't notice. Now we need something to chase them down with, says Derek. I think I have something in mind, says Chad. He runs over to Willie Mole who is still handcuffed to the car. Willie, we need to borrow your chopper, for old times sake, Chad says sarcastically. They force Willie to drive them to his penthouse, then hurried to the top where the landing pad was. Still holding Willie at gunpoint Derek says OK Willie, you took us this far, we need one more little favor. The chopper takes off from the top of the building and begins flying toward Queens. Derek takes his phone out and makes a call. Hey we're coming to pick you up. Hope you didn't have too much trouble. No, I've had messier. Says Mickey who we see smoking a cigarette. I'll be waiting for you outside. We see him leave a room with the bodies of Saul and Nick on the floor. Meanwhile, sailing quickly along the Smith Town Bay north of Long Island, are Gary, Lexi and the Forks men. Lexi is tied up in a chair. Gary looks at her and speaks was it nice seeing your brother again? A shame it was so short. Maybe they'll find you. Hope you know how to swim. Of course, by the time I'll be living it up in the Caymans. She looks at him with great hatred and disdain. Suddenly, one of the Forks men falls to the ground with a hole in his head. Gary looked around with surprise to find the shooter but then he realized he could hear the thumping of a chopper in the distance. Meanwhile, in the chopper, Derek was getting congratulated on his incredible shot. Hold her steady, says Derek as he lines up another shot. As they get closer to the boat, Gary's men start returning fire. The chopper absorbs the bullets as Willie tries to keep it moving to avoid hits to the glass. Mickey takes the submachine gun and fires toward the boat, taking out another Forks. The remaining Forks run into the covered area shielding themselves from the chopper. We aren't going to be able to hit them from up here. We have to drop down, take them out and grab her, says Derek. Willie thanks for the ride. We'll let you live. The three of them bungee out of the chopper onto the deck of the boat. One of the Forks guys tries to shoot them but Derek takes him out before he can even lift his gun. The final two falls back into the lower compartment. Okay now how are we going to get to them? Asks Chad. I'll drop down and take their fire while you two flank them from the other door says Mickey. You'll kill yourself. Says Chad. Don't worry about me. This isn't the first boat I got shot at on. Derek and Chad find the other door. Mickey opens the door the Forks guys went through. Mickey drops down and rolls as the Forks guys fire at him. Derek and Chad kick open the other door shooting the Forks guys from behind. They run over to see Mickey who is bleeding from his shoulder and his ear. You okay Mick? You took a few hits. Says Derek. I'll live. Now go get that son of a bitch replies Mickey. The two see another door leading to what had to be the bedroom. As they push the door open, a bullet ricochets in their general direction. Come any closer and I'll shoot her, yells Gary. The two back away from the door. Chad peers over and sees Gary holding Lexi in front of him again with the gun to her head. Chad drops his gun and walks into the room. I said get away Chad. You want her death to be because of you? Chad took a look at his sister, seeing the fear and sadness in her eyes. He felt scared and helpless, unable yet again to save her. He thought about their childhood and other memories that came flashing back to him. Was this really the last time he'd see her? Suddenly, the entire room leapt into the air a bit, as if they had hit something with the hull. 
it was enough to throw Gary off balance for a brief moment, then for Chad to lunge with enough force to knock Gary to the ground. He wrenched the gun from Gary's hand, then punched him several times, as he was still reeling from the torrent of emotions that he was going through. Before Chad could injure Gary too badly, Derek pulled Chad away. Trust me you don't want to follow that path kid. Now let's get this arsehole back to land. Chad unties his sister, then they embrace for a long hug. They tie up Gary. Then Derek checks on Mickey. Then they check the damage to the boat to make sure that they were still seaworthy. The boat was pretty banged up from hitting a large boy but there didn't appear to be signs of leakage. They found a first aid kit and wrapped the bandages around Mickey's wounds. Derek finds the captain's nest or whatever it's called and takes control of the ship. He begins driving it back to shore. Chad and Lexi are on the deck recapping each other's ordeals. Lexi tells him about her finding out about their sick social experiment, how they tried to silence her, and how Derek rescued her and kept her safe in hiding while they figured out a plan to rescue him. Chad tells his side of the story, where he was assimilated by a group of doppelganger musicians that convinced him that Derek was picking them off, and his help was needed to stop him. He told her about the battle at the concert where he narrowly escaped getting blown up and was taken back to his apartment to be set up to overdose before being rescued by Derek. I'm just so relieved that this is all over says Lexi, I'm glad that you're still alive, they say at the same time. Derek docks the boat back at the hideout. Gary, now awake, starts spewing violent threats at the four of them until Chad shoves his sock in his mouth. What are we going to do with him? asks Chad. Don't worry about him Chad, you take your sister home. You two need to recuperate. I'll take care of our friend Gary. Said Derek I think Gary and I have some catching up to do as well. Gary tries to protest through the sock, but it's muffled. Chad and Lexi step off the boat and head into Derek's hideout. Derek throws the keys to Chad. Do you have any last words that you want to say to this prick before we leave? Chad sighed. Gary you were like a brother to me, I thought you were someone that I could trust. But looks like that was a fucking lie, he turns to Derek. Now get him out of my sight. Derek nods, then points to Mickey. Help Mickey get patched up. There's a medical kit in the bathroom downstairs. They go inside. Derek pilots the boat out of the dock with Gary on board. They disappear over the horizon. Six months pass. Chad steps out of a rehab center that he checked himself into. He was finally clean. A crowd of people are outside holding signs congratulating him as well as his sister who was there to pick him up. She was five months pregnant with Derek's child, who is now her fiancé. You look great Chad, as healthy as I've ever seen you. Chad smiled. It was not easy. These past few months were rough. But knowing that you were still around to support me got me through. Lexi responded of course I'll be there for you. They hugged. Then Chad asked what's Derek up to now? Where's your future hubby at? Lexi responded. He partnered up with Mickey. Now they have a successful bodyguard business up and running. He would have came but he had to handle some business. He'll meet us at the house. So, what are your plans now Chad? Chad answered without waiting music is my passion, I can't think of anything else that I would do. I'll call up my old record labels, find out if they want to work together again. I've been in the news so much, people should be lining up to work with me. Lexi responds, whatever you do, you have my full support. I believe in you Chad. Now let's get home. Derek should be waiting for us.